Ah, turn that on. That helps. Test one, two. Do you hear me remotely? Great. Okay, let's see. Let's see. Uh, Spencer, how do you feel about taking notes? How do you feel about taking notes? Oh, God, no. <laughs> I, 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 have, I have a note from Sean Turner, the notes that I did for him. Uh, yesterday in which were maybe the worst I think I've ever done. All right, so apparently, uh, yeah, you stop. Yeah, Stefan, I think has done my notes like the last three ABT core meetings, so I think he has he's you know justifiably excused. That's true, there are people online. Um, Hello. 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 Yes. Hello? Yes. I I'm can sorry. hear you. Are you volunteering to take notes? No, no, no. I've, we're having technical difficulties here and we're just trying to figure out if we were being heard or not. So thank you. You are now being You're heard. You're being heard. Yes. But if you speak up again, you'll be the note taker. <laughs> <laughs> as, the, as he quickly mutes. Um, let's see. Who do we see here? Sergio's presenting. Let's see. Uh, David, would you be interested in taking notes? I'm going to start randomly clicking on people in the participants list and telling them, asking them if they can take notes. Uh, oh, I guess. I oh. Can do one OK, Mag Magnus, Magnus says he will take notes. Thank you, Magnus. And But if other people want to also join the, the Cody MD or whatever we're calling it now. Um, what? HedgeDoc. HedgeDoc. I keep changing the name. Yes. Um, exactly. And keep an eye on, on whether he, you think he's captured everything. That would also be great. At which point, I think, since it is now 1.34, uh, we can get started. Welcome to the AVT work, core working group, either here in Philadelphia or wherever in the world you might happen to be. Uh, am I, oh, um, that's right, we're not starting the slides. Okay, if you're here in person, um, please sign into the Medico, usually the Medico Lite if you're here in person. Um, that both lets you join the queue and make sure you're recorded on the blue sheets um, and lets you participate in, if we do any polls, all of which are good things. Um, if you're here in person and you choose to join the full version, keep your audio and video off because you can already see us the uh, old fashioned way. And um, please, Everybody's doing that well now, but please keep, if you're here in the room, um, please keep your masks on unless you are actively speaking at the front of the room. Um, if you're remote, keep your, um, don't send audio or video unless you are pre uh, presenting during a session or asking a question. And um, use of a headset is strongly recommended because sometimes the echo cancellation doesn't work right. Next. Um, 
remote meeting tips. You enter the queue with the no hand, leave with hand because who knows why. Um, you'll need to enable your audio when it's your turn to talk. Um, similarly, uh, the unmuting icons, um, you can also enable video if you want, but that's separate from audio. If you just enable your video, we will see you but not hear you, which for most purposes is not terribly useful. Um, video is encouraged, um, but not, not required. Next. Uh, here are some links. Um, you can't click on them in here, but you can go to the, if you go to the data tracker, you can find various information. You can, you can find the, the slides and they should be clickable in there, I think. Next. No, well, um, hopefully everybody has seen this by now since it's Thursday, but if not, um, you are agreeing to, uh, by participating in the IETF, you're agreeing to follow the IETF procedures. Notably, um, you have to declare if you have IPR, that's an oversimplification. Please read the things um, uh, to read for more details. Um, you can you acknowledge that we can have audio and video recordings of you and you agree to follow the code of conduct. Next, um, especially please everybody keep things um, professional and uh, you know, avoid harassing anybody or the like. And if you see anybody harassing, contact the ombuds team or the chairs. Next. And as I mentioned, mask policy, we seem to be good now, but please, if when you're in uh, I, the uh, meeting rooms, please wear a certified mask unless you're actively speaking at the front of the room. Next. Uh, here's the about this meeting. Uh, we have Magnus as a note taker. As mentioned, if other people want to join the hedge doc and back him up, he, I'm sure he would appreciate it. Um, I will keep an eye on the chat to the extent that I can while doing everything else. Um, if you need something relayed, if your audio isn't working for whatever reason in your remote, please um, type into the chat and we can re repeat what you said into the room. Next. Uh, we're going to ask Eve to say a few words about Steve Kastner. Eve? Hey, can you hear me? Yes, we, we can. can. Okay, great. Um, thanks for the opportunity to say a few words about Steve Kastner, a longtime friend and colleague and mentor to many of us within the IETF community. These remarks are a slightly longer version of the tribute prepared for the plenary yesterday and they include a few additional photos and links to a few online readings, writings, and viewings. For those of you who may not have had the pleasure of knowing Steve directly, his vision and leadership were instrumental to the success of IETF multimedia standards and protocols that have driven the success of IP-based telephony and multimedia conferencing, as well as other real-time multicast and unicast applications. He began that journey at Occidental College. He graduated in 1973 with a degree in mathematics, and then he obtained a master's in computer science from the University of Southern California in 1976. Beginning in 1974, he joined USC's Information Sciences Institute as a graduate student and remained there for 22 years. He contributed to the software design and implementation of some of the earliest experiments with packet voice on the ARPANET and thus he contributed to the publication of the Network Voice Protocol, RFC 741, published in 1977, a year before the TCP IP split and a year before UDP was defined. As high bandwidth packet satellite and terrestrial networks became operational in the 1980s, he led the multimedia conferencing project at ISI to develop and deploy packet video over those networks. He built a custom packet-oriented video codec and later developed techniques that allowed commercial video codecs designed for circuits to operate over packet switch networks. It was at ISI in 1988, hate to confess that, uh, that I first met Steve, I date myself, and, but I had the privilege to work closely with him over six and a half years. It is also where I was indoctrinated through him into the IETF community culture and working group process. That same year, in 1988, Steve is documented in the proceedings of the IETF 11 
as having participated in his first ITF meeting in Annapolis, uh, Maryland. And as many of you may recall, his lovely wife of over 40 years, Karen Kastner, often attended IETF meetings with him. At that time, Steve attended to contribute to the working group focused on the experimental internet stream protocol version two that provided the technical underpinnings of the earliest ISI BBN packet video teleconferencing system. ST, as it was known, however, was connection oriented, not datagram like, like IP. It included a small header using per hop identifiers and supported point to point or multi to uh, point to multi point connections, as well as providing network bandwidth reservation what would later become RFC 1190. Steve would go on to found the Audio Video Transport Working Group, ABT, facets, facets of which live on today in ABT Core. He served as its chair, he served later as co-chair um, from 1991 until 2003. He authored 15 RFCs and most notably was an author and the principal editor of the Real-Time Transport Protocol, RTP, specification which has had a huge impact, as you all know, on multimedia data transmission in, on, and across the internet. Steve regularly acknowledged that RTP's design drew significantly from the earlier network voice protocol and its sister protocol, the packet video protocol, the designs of which were spearheaded by the late Danny Cohen, who ran the networking division at ISI. Beginning in 1992, Steve was the primary organizer of the movement to establish the worldwide internet multicast backbone, affectionately referred to as the M-Bone, an experimental virtual network overlaying the internet for broadcast of audio and video using multicast IP and RTP-based applications. It was launched, in case you didn't know this, at the request of Alison Mankin, who was pregnant at the time and unable to travel to the upcoming ITF meetings. The M-Bone enabled live streaming of ITF meetings, including return audio from remote participants, and in many ways, the Mbone tools were the precursor to our hybrid meet echo meetings and the precursor to the multitude of video conferencing apps in our lives today. The Mbone was carried, uh, the Mbone also carried the first internet radio broadcasts. It provided audio chat rooms for network geeks, streamed NASA TV of the first Hubble repair, broadcasted a Rolling Stones concert resulting in a Newsweek article boldly displaying Steve Kastner, Van Jacobson, and Steve Deering as our modern day superheroes, and demonstrated the first distributed music performance with distributed performers at the ACM Multimedia 94 conference. In 1995, Steve took his expertise into the commercial arena to further develop conferencing and streaming apps at Precept Software, later acquired by Cisco Systems in 1998, where he was a distinguished engineer. From 2000 until retiring in 2014, he shifted gears to work on network performance measurement and routing analysis as a fellow at Packet Design. In retirement, he continued to work on various projects such as volunteering for the Computer History Museum to produce an operational emulation of the 1960s era IBM 1620 computer, a room size computer where he first got his start in coding as an undergrad at Occidental College. As a brilliant engineer, Steve also enjoyed sharing his creations with others, one of the more unique ones being his solid state digital monopoly game that he first showcased at the PC Festival in Anaheim in 1978, which he continued to tinker with and improve over the decades, but deliberately tried to preserve the usage of the technology from the era when it was first created. At the same time he was pushing the envelope of internet architecture, Steve also was an early, early adopter of electric vehicle technology and fit his house with solar panels decades ago. Not surprisingly, he enjoyed helping debug the early Tesla Roadster EV before it was released to the public. And yes, that's a picture of some of the earliest Roadster owners on a group road trip down the coast of California, photo taken out of the back of Steve's red Roadster, hopefully by the passenger and not the driver. For those of you who had the privilege to work with Steve, you know firsthand that he had an encyclopedic knowledge about anything and everything with which he became involved. And he enjoyed being a keeper of the prehistory of the internet's evolution toward packet audio and video. His attention to detail was unrivaled by anybody I have ever met, whether it was in bringing the real-time transport protocol to life or in rebuilding historical electronics. His meticulousness motivated those of us lucky enough to collaborate with him to bring our best selves to the task at hand. And in addition to his wisdom, Steve was the consummate role model for quiet leadership, humility, and kindness. In 2011, he was awarded the 2011 Leadership Award 
by the International Multimedia Teleconferencing Consortium. And in 2020, he was the co-recipient of the IEEE Internet Award, having been nominated by his ABT co-chair, Colin Perkins, whose wise words I paraphrase here. Steve has long provided an example of how an IETF working group chair should act with humility and fairness while building on a deep understanding of the underlying technology and systems architecture. He saw consensus where none seemed possible. He would patiently listen to all sides of an argument, identify the concerns, correct misunderstandings of the architecture, and then quietly, carefully, and respectfully help the working group come to consensus. It is without doubt that Steve's technical and leadership contributions were essential to the success of RTP, in particular, and internet multimedia standards and protocols in general. Steve passed away on the morning of July 4th, 2022, an auspicious date in the US, celebrated as Independence Day. When the fireworks began in the evening, this July 4th, I couldn't help but imagine the fireworks were celebrating Steve's life, all that he accomplished and all the people whose lives he touched. In conclusion, and to echo the sentiments of the many people who reached out to me after my posting to the IETF list about Steve's passing, it was truly a gift to have worked with him. Steve, you'll be sorely missed. For those of you who wish to send condolences to his family, or to know further details about the memorial to be held in August, or to donate to the endowed chair in computer science that he and Karen seated with the honorarium from the IEEE Internet Award and it was established for the newly created CS department at his alma mater, please reach out to me. Next slide. Um, I assembled a few pointers to readings and writings and viewings for those of you who might like to reminisce a little bit further. Thank you again for this opportunity to share some thoughts with you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to say a few words about Steve? Okay, thank you. Oh, Ma Magnus is coming up. Oh, Magnus, okay. Yeah. Uh, is that on? Okay, yes. so Magnus Westland. Yeah, I mean, I replaced or tried to replace the, yeah, Steve Kaster as co chair of ABT back in 2003. Very large shoes to try to step after. Um, and, and provided very, I think, very good role model for how to be a chair and go on. And I think it's been very important for my development in ITF. So I will keep on remembering. Colin? Yeah, uh, I have uh, I think little to add that hasn't been said already. Um, there are some very big shoes to fill. Steve was, um, uh, I think, uh, the, the role model for how a chair should behave. Uh, always um, as Eve said, always um, incredibly well prepared, incredibly knowledgeable, incredibly polite, incredibly tactful, and willing to work to, to gauge consensus. And, uh, it, it, it's his, it was very much a privilege to work with him. Uh, and, uh, I, I hope uh, I, I, I ho hope I um, lived up to those shoes when I uh, joined as co-chair. Uh, I hope uh, it would be uh, um, a, 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 an example for many in the ITF, I think, of the way he chaired groups. He'll be missed. All right. Thank you, everybody. It's... Thank you so much. All right, now on to our regular agenda, which I'm sure he would want us to continue to work on. Uh, so we're going to start with uh, Cryptex with Sergio and the DVC payload format, the skip payload format, uh, 7983 BIS, which is the demultiplexing, and then two things in RTP over quick, both the, both the RTP proper and the SDP, 
uh, and then uh, V3C and uh, green metadata. Any objections or shall we continue? Okay, seems good. Next. Uh, next slide, Bernard. Bernard? Hmm. Uh, maybe I should take over doing the slides. I don't know. Bernard, are you there? Uh, all right, let's see. I'm going to take over driving the slides. No, that's not what I wanted to do. How do I? Oh, no, I do this. And right. Okay, yeah. So draft status. We have published. Uh, RTT, multi-party RTT mix and uh, JPEG access. VP9 is still in MISREF, waiting indirectly on frame marking. Um, uh, does everybody still hear us from, from the remote people? Making sure that we didn't lose anybody when I did that. See some people unmuting themselves. Uh, okay, somebody says so she'll yeah. fine, so that's good. Yeah, right. we're good. Good, thank you. Um, yeah, maybe Bernard got called away from his desk. Um, and yeah, we've done uh, last call on Cryptex and VVC. We'll have some comments on the, uh, the ITF last call on Cryptex and VVC. We'll have some comments on those. Um, well, it says, somebody says there's no slides. Do other people have slides? You know, we're on, if you want to get it, things aren't working yeah, we, right. We can see them. Or okay, can you can. Them. Okay, great. Oh, you're back, Bernard. Great. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so, and then, and we did, um, we need a revised ID on frame marking. Um, so Mo is nodding in the back of the room. So hopefully that means that will happen soon. Um, yes, and then uh, working group last call completed um, on uh, skip and 793 bis. We'll have discussions of those. And we have adopted RTP over quick. And we need a call for adoption name set up for RTP, which we'll talk about next slide, I think it is. Yes, so on game state over RTP, um, there were only two responses, one of whom was the same organization as the initial proposer. So um, our suggestion is that um, the proponents uh, go to the community. I, I get the impression that the interested community here is not the usual uh, suspects we get here in the ABT core group. So um, we're asking, and I've asked uh, Colin this also personally, asking them to send to go and um, try to get some people to express interest in the document. Um, and we will uh, extend our call for adoption uh, until sometime in September so that people can do it after August vacations. So if- yeah. I guess one question is, do we know who the, who the core constituency is so we can actually reach them, which we presumably we didn't do the last time? Yeah, I mean, I think what we should do is we should um, ask, I mean, uh, Colin Jennings as the person who proposed this to um, to talk to, I mean, I think he knows who the community is, so he, we should ask him to, to bring, ask them to come and indicate their interest in this. If they are still interested. 
All right, next, Cryptex, uh, Sergio. Hi, hello. So next slide, please. So the current status of the draft is that since we submitted it for ISG review, we have received 39 comments of feedback here between the, the IAZ review, IANA, and SDB directorate review. So uh, all the non-contentious feedback has been uh, incorporated into the draft. And there are three feedback that I considered it as one fix that I will explain later. And three, eight open, uh, still open issues that it is uh, what I am going to explain during this meeting. So we try to, to get feedback from them and, and try to, to see um, how to address them. Some of them is, um, is just call to action. So it's, it's uh, deciding if we agree on, on the feedback and if we incorporate it or not. So I think that most of the will be easy to explain, but not sure if easy to get a consensus. So next slide, please. So the, the one fix issues is the first one is was the use of inclusive language. Um, this was uh, mainly because of the of the term master key. That's I don't, that I don't think that I can change it in the in the draft because it is uh, referencing the master key term in the RFC three seven one one. So I think that uh, if we need to if we have to change or for changing the draft, uh, the grifted draft, we'll have to also update the RFC 3711 uh, to, to update and, and remove the, the the master key term and replace it for, for something else. Uh, and then the next one was uh, a request to see if we can provide more details about the fingerprint issues about the, the, the RTP, the usage of the RTP header extension. A part of what it is already shown in the or described in the header extension uh, RFC. I don't think that there is anything else that I can reference. So that's what I have considered this, this as not fixed. If anyone has uh, any any draft or any publication that we can link, it will be great. But if not, I, I think that uh, we cannot do much more on this. And the, the last one was uh, about uh, checking if uh, we should register the, new, the two new values for the definite by profile uh, that the value that it was incorporated in the draft. But um, there is no IANA register already for these uh, values. So I don't think that it is something that Chris Tech needs to solve. If we, the, it should be done in either RCC uh, 85 or, or even in the RFC uh, uh, 3550. Uh, so um, I don't, because uh, again, I don't think that Christa should just add a, a IANA register if uh, or the other draft that uh, define these values and, and define the register, we could add the values that we have defined in the, in the draft. So any feedback about these issues? Uh, Murray? Uh, this is Murray about the IANA question. So does that mean we're okay with those values just being registered in a scattering of RFCs and that's, we're okay with that? Or just make yeah, sure? I think for, for, yeah, I mean, these are, I think the second and third ever defined for, I mean, sorry, maybe third and fourth ever decide, defined for this value. And I think I'm, I mean, I think at some point it might be useful to do a registry if we ever get any more of these, but I wouldn't recommend blocking this draft on that. I'm okay with it. Just okay, I, I guess the other option yeah. is like, do you want to make a separate document? That just all it does is create the registry and collect values and you could do that too. I'm, yeah. I'm fine. I just wanted yeah. to see like- I mean, I think, you know, if, I think that might be worth doing if we ever get a, another one, but for now, I think it's probably not necessary. Okay. So next slide, please. So there, there was another the, uh, one uh, issue raised by by Ayana that uh, there was a mismatch between the, the the description of the parameter and what was actually being registered. So we said that it could be used at, at session level or media level, but the Ayana registration only registered it for media level. 
Uh, I think this was a, a mistake that I made when one of the drafts. So I removed it uh, unintentionally the the session level one. And what I have done in the in the new draft is to just put back again that it can be used for session level and media level. But uh, as I mean, as it was, it is a change to the to the to the to the draft. I wanted to to raise it here to just to see if. This is a, this is still the consensus of the group, or if anyone has any any concern about how it did at both session level or media level. So next slide, please. Also, there was two questions about IPRs. And then I don't think that we need to 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 do anything. Bernard already already answer the those issues in, in both the mailing list and in the issues uh, and i'm not sure if we need to do anything else regarding this to to fix the to, or to cover the, the 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 feedback or if we need to do anything else regarding this yeah. <clears throat> well we we covered it in the last meeting and also on the mailing list so i think the only issue was that at the time i did the write-up we didn't have the disclosure so that's why the confusion was created mm -hmm. okay thank you bernard so next one, please. So this one is the, there was one uh, that uh, that recommended that this should be formally update the RPC 3711 because uh, also the this is a mechanism that updates uh, or is a alternative approach of Heather, of Heather and Christian as the one that is explaining in RPC uh, uh, 6904. So as this night of force updates uh, RPC 3711, this draft should also update it. So this is what I have done in the in the latest draft. So first is that uh, to check that if uh, everyone is okay if, uh, with this change. And the second thing is that uh, when I have included this in the in the in the in the draft, I have two warnings when when updated to the when when, when submitting the draft. And I'm not sure if uh, the first one should be ignored or not, or yeah. if anyone can get me some, some guidance regarding that. Yeah, the first one can be ignored. The second one, I think, should probably be. Yeah. Yeah. And Stefan, yeah. did you have a comment? Stefan, this is just uh, with respect to this IPR slide. Uh, there were some languages offense me a little bit, and I would put, to put on the record that I don't believe the ITF has something like a um, requirement for an IPR disclosure to be compatible with something the ITF has. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there are certain formal requirements how to make a disclosure but and when to make a disclosure, but what is in there uh, is none of our business here. Yeah, certainly yeah. there's no such thing as an incompatible with the ITF IPR disclosure. Thank you. All right. So yeah, I think on this slide, I think yeah, the your two resolutions are correct. Ignore the disclaimer. That's just making sure you didn't import any text from thirty seven eleven, which yep. you didn't. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So next slide, please. Yeah. This one is a bit more. Uh, uh, there was some some feedback about if uh, we should first deprecate RPC uh, six nine oh four, and then is uh, if we should, um, if, if both are negotiated, if we should uh, mandate or we should recommend that uh, crypto should be used uh, instead of uh, RPC 6904, because currently the, it is up to the implementation, so. Yeah, um, in this one, Sergio, I, I don't know if it makes sense because when you offer both Cryptex and 6904, it means I can receive either one. Right, which you might do because you don't know what the other side will actually support, right? Hmm. Presumably, the other the answer should only pick one of them. Yeah. So I think you know I think this is, this question is a bit confused. Yeah, I think that it is about if it, it is uh, if one receiver support both. If the sender, if we should say that the sender should use grid text instead of instead of RCC six nine zero four. Well, it, it's up to the sender, right? The the yeah. sender can pick one. The sender, remember, the sen the other side, the answer is also saying what it can receive, mm -hmm. right? It's it's not it's not 
choosing from among the things that the that are there in the offer. It's saying what I can receive. So it might also say I can receive both. <laughs> it's up to the sender then to decide what to send. But do we want to give any guidance on towards that? Yeah, you could give guidance on that. It's not, yeah, on yeah. what you should send if if you have the option of both. Yeah. yeah. Magnus, did you have a? Uh, my name is Westland. Yeah, I think it would be wrong to deprecate the normal way of doing the per header extensions. Uh, I know there are other usages out there, or at least proposed usages. Well, it's not compatible with Cryptex. Uh, so obviously, there are things where you do need the in the clear header. Yeah, so, yeah. I, mean, I guess it's not wouldn't be to deprecate the header extensions. You know, unencrypted header extensions at all. It's do you want to do you want to deprecate the of the old header extension encryption mechanism. Yeah, but the, no. So I know that 3 people has some proposals where they will put, they want to have header extensions declared. I think there might also be header extensions that need to be encrypted. So therefore the old mechanisms is going to be needed, um, which is so. So therefore, and I think it's, it's as uh, if I understood Bernard correct here is like, yeah, let the application declare and select what to express their preference according to normal STP rules, et cetera, or other single mechanisms. So, yeah, I mean, my inclination would be to say if you support both, you know, you should do cryptex unless you have a need to send both, unless you actually have an application need to send both encrypted and in the clear headers in the same packets. Would that be reasonable? If you support both. I, I mean, if if you intend to encrypt everything, yeah, I guess it should would be fine. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'd suggest um, if if you follow that, Sergio, I'd say suggest you know do a a PR and post to the list and ask. Mm -hmm. Magnus, are you getting back in the queue, or are you? Just, or did I need to remove your heart? Okay. All right. Um, Okay, That's so good yeah, so, so we said no that we should not deprecate the RCC six nine oh four, and we put a PR for with the suit uh, if the sender support both that it should uh, it should send the cryptex instead if even if it if it doesn't require to to specifically send a, a, a header, some header station encrypted and some others not encrypted. That would be my inclination, but you know, if anybody else has any comments, Ma? Uh, well, I, mean, I, I agree that you should not deprecate 6904. Um, that that would that would make sense. Um, but if you're negotiating cryptex and you do see and you also support 6904, um, I think the whole point of supporting cryptex is you want more security and you want you know less yeah. revealed. Um, so I don't understand why you would say should and not must here. If you say should, what is the exception of when you when you may not I, again, I think if you actually have an application need to have some header extensions in the clear and some encrypted. But but why would you negotiate cryptex then? Mm, maybe, <laughs> maybe you wouldn't. Yeah. No. Yeah. You're, you're not actually negotiating it, Mo. You're just saying I I am capable of receiving it. Right. That's a separate choice from what you send. So you think that there's a security requirement asymmetrically that uh, that. I, I'm very security conscious about what I receive, but I'm not very security conscious about what I send. Stranger things have happened. No, no. I mean, it's. I'm just saying the decisions are separate. I think what we're talking about here is what you send if the other side says it can receive both. Well, I, I thought that the resolution was going to be to say if you support both, then you should use cryptex. And usually, when you put a should, you should you specify when you would not. What's the exception? Why is it not a must? When would you? not do this and i'm having a hard time envisioning what useful text you would say yeah. of when you would not do this yeah I, I i suggest we um discuss this on the list once we have text once we have a pr okay yeah because okay. i don't want to take too much time on this right. okay thank you this is late please yeah so this one is uh, uh in, currently we say that if we say that uh, that uh, we support created that we or and 
and the application considering that it is mandatory, but uh, we receive an RTP that has not accrued the headers that uh, we should process in the, in the, in the RTP packet. And, and the question was, is not a mass stop? So, I mean, I, I would agree, given that it, there's there's the if you consider it mandatory, which is obviously yeah. an implementation decision, I think must is fine for that conditional case. Personally. Yeah. Sort of, mm -hmm. That's sort of the definition of mandatory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I agree. So mm -hmm. either we, we, we should change uh, the, the mandatory or we should put a mass there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, next slide. So this is uh, what is the, the next step. So I will I will just make the, the PR that it is missing and publish it to the to the mailing list for confirmation. And when that is done, is I will publish a new grid text uh, draft. And I'm not sure what mm, do we need to do next. If we should have a last call again or again ISG review. I think. Well, well I'm trying. To, what, um, what exactly is the procedure? Uh, you know, um, if I think you, I think it just goes to the IESG and the IESG members decide whether it um, satisfies their uh, discuss and comments. So I think that's all we yeah, need. I, I, I don't think these changes are big enough to require another working group last call. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Okay. 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 So, and all right. All from the side. So thank you, Ben. Hold on, did it, Magnus, did you have a clarification for notes? Just yeah. Did you say that this is good to mass for your I yeah, um, so on this one I think we said I think we said we'd go to must in you know I think that uh, Sergio said either go to must or change the word mandatory. I'd be inclined to say go to must because I think that's the easiest, you know, easiest thing to you know say. But anybody else have any comments? All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that's it. Okay. For the okay. Thank you, Sergio. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. And Stefan's up next. Yeah, I think I will do this from here. Uh, Stefan Wenger, VVC payload form, and next slide. Thank you. So, uh, version 16 was out uh, in the ISG. They came up with um, three discusses and a whole bunch of useful comments including a real stupid bug from our side. Uh, we populated the, the YANA template only halfway and copy-paste errors, stupid stuff. Anyway, um, a, of the, these three discusses, um, uh, two were cleared after we published version 17. Uh, in 17, we tried to address everything. Um, Sahet's risk uh, discuss remained, and that is uh, related to uh, a technology that was introduced in RFC 3984 back 20 years ago or so uh, regarding sender properties, which is something that somewhat changes the, um, in, in an offer answer scenario, somewhat changes the semantics of, of how you use STP basically. Um, now, um, that, uh, that history was uh, probably not uh, um, in, in Saad's mind when he uh, came up with this discuss. So we had a meeting this morning, um, and uh, the the outcome of that meeting is that we'll add informative language explaining this unusual behavior of SPROP code points um, and issue a version 18. And he plans to clear his discuss against that version 18 if, if things are looking good. And then um, our suggestion, our author's suggestion is um, the updated YANA template, which was the only significant normative change, actually the only normative change, if I recall, uh, that was signed up uh, by by the YANA review, uh, signed off, and uh, the area directors generally responded, thanks for addressing our comments, da, da, da. So I think uh, we, and this change here will be in, in, uh, purely informative, so I think we don't need another last call here in the working group. And what the IDF is doing is up to the, what the ISG is doing is up to the ISG, obviously. Uh, thank you very much. I personally concur. I think that should be fine. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Stefan. Any, any comments on any of that? Or shall we move on? 
All right, next is Skip. I think, Dan, are you presenting? Or is it Mike? Oh, Mike is presenting. I'll start, okay. this, uh, I'll start this show off a little bit. Okay, sure. Um, uh, this is Mike Fowler, and good afternoon to uh, the AVT Corp community. Uh, next, next slide, please. Our, our status is awaiting external review resolution of issues raised. Um, we have an email is referenced here from the, the music working group that indicates their review of the SDP is complete. And I guess the important message is it does not define any new SDP attributes. There is no need for any new SDP procedures. Um, GenArt's review had a, a simple summary of the, the simple document is adequate to register the media type as is. Art Art had some questions on it and basically said not ready and we'll go over the, the comments uh, from the community uh, in the next slides. Uh, our draft is due to expire on November 26th and Dan will pick up this. We, uh, we put this together. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I guess the, one of the main issues that was actually raised in both comments for Gen Art and Art Art was regarding the references to Skip 210 and references to Skip 214. Um, both of these groups wanted them to be normative. Um, however, I believe that this group actually determined way back when that these would be informational documents. Um, as as far as we go, it, as far as our opinion, it doesn't really matter to us. I guess it's just a matter of coming to a resolution on this as far as which type of reference this should be. Bernard? Yeah, um, as you've said, I think many times, th this is document is not the documentation of SKIP. So it's it's merely the documentation of, of essentially the SDP. So I, I don't think it's... Uh, the, the comment says you, ne you need it to implement SKIP, but I don't think that's necessarily relevant, which is why we allowed it to be informational. So there may be a little bit of misunderstanding there on the part of the reviewer as to, as to what the document is actually doing. Okay. All right, then we'll, we'll keep it as informational reference uh, at this point. Okay. Uh, next slide. Uh, let's see. Yeah, the art, art group mentioned that 214 is only mentioned uh, at one point in the document. Um, we've discussed possibly even removing the reference to 214.2 from, from this document only because it's internally, the skip 214 is really a precursor to this upcoming RFC, if you will. Um, so it's kind of can go away, if you will. I guess the only issue I saw with that is that it is actually referenced in the IANA registration. Um, so we, I guess, as part of that update, and it kind of leads into another question later on about also about the IANA registration, about how that it would affect if we do decide to remove the SCIP 214 reference from our document. Bernard? Yeah, I, I think you could remove it and then update the registration. Um, since it seems like all the comments refer to the references, having as few as possible just might, might just uh, say to some hassle. Yeah. You know, I, one, the, one, the real yeah. question is, you know, do you do you need this reference? Is it is it, you know, uh, really necessary to understand the document? And as you've said, I for two fourteen, I think the answer is no. Um, right. Like, like I said, it was kind of a for internally for our for our working group, the skip working group, it was really a precursor to to this reference and it and its its content is essentially what this RFC is. So it can kind of go away, if you will, from yeah. from our yeah. from this IETF document. So the the other way to think of it though is also the fact that the that while the information presented in two fourteen dot two and this draft RIC are are nearly identical, the, the communities that will actually use them um, are different and their references are are more relevant. You know, the, the RFC is meant f for people outside of our SCIP community who are building products that have to carry our payloads. Um, and that's what they need to build to. The, the SCIP is, references 
for ECUs and units that will be implementing the full scope of a bunch of other SCIP documents. Um, and this would be the only place that provides a tie-in uh, for that, for those functions. So remove it if it gets this along, that's great. Uh, otherwise, it, it is the tie-in to the community, the SCIP community and the, uh, the networking community. I mean, I think, yeah. oh, go ahead, sorry, Bernard. Yeah, I guess my only question would be, you know, just it's a maintenance question. You know, are you going to, uh, you know, what if you decide to do an update for video or something? Are you going to do it in the skip 214 series, like have a dot three? Are you going to update this document? That that might be the only reason it's relevant is if you're trying to point someone to it. But if this document really kind of supersedes and obsoletes 214.2 and there's no plan to have a dot three or dot four or something, then it seems like the reference is gratuitous. Yeah. I, I I can see it both ways. That's the only way I bring it up, but because the RFC won't won't uh, obsolete the document to our community. Um, yeah. But yeah, the, I uh, think the only and the only alternative I would have is just to, I mean, if you are do want to keep it in, just mention it somewhere outside the abstract. Just mention it in the introduction or something, saying, "Hey, this used to be defined by two fourteen point two, but this supersedes that," or something like that. So just just so it's more clear to people where what the document is, you know, just as it says, like so it's mentioned somewhere besides the abstract and the registration, just you know, inf informationally. If you want to do that, otherwise, as I said, yeah, taking it out would be fine. Yeah, if, if you're in agreement, I think we'll probably just remove it. Yeah, that sounds fine to me. All right. Okay. Go ahead All right. Again. Thanks. Uh, next slide. And back to the. Back to the registration here, I guess the question was uh, the sections 5.1 and 5.2 of this document are basically, a, a, if you will, a, a, the IANA registration. Um, we did do that earlier uh, before we before we submitted this uh, draft, uh, skip draft, and we did register the payload types first. I think the question was, um, as far as updating the IANA registration for this was, um, or having it also repeated, if you will, in our document, in this document, um, I guess it was there, it talked, it, one of the questions was about how to update contact information and things like that, about um, that. I don't know if we could throw that question out there to, um, to talk about first year, I guess, what the process is, if there is a process for updating contact, if that's, yeah, um, I, I think that if the uh, the goal of this document is to change these registrations to refer to this document rather than 214.2. So I think if you explicitly say on both the bullets on this slide, this, you know, updates this registration to be this document rather than the, the previous registration, I think that, that it should be fun. Then you're not repeating the, and you're not repeating the registration, you're changing the registration, and that's fine. Right, and, and I yeah. guess that would because there's there also a, there's actually a reference it points to two fourteen dot two in that I N registration so we I mean that section would have to be updated sorry uh, would have to be updated to remove that remove those references as well so yeah just again not, yeah. not not a big deal so yeah so yeah I think that should that should be fine just as, okay. well, as long as it's clear that this is this is do this is not repeating something that already exists it's doing something new that should be fine. Right, right. Mm. And I got, I guess, is the, the, the comment for it that the section seven and the, the second bullet there about adding mm. instructions to IANA to point to this document when it becomes an RFC rather than the those, those things. I guess it's just what a sentence or two or whatever. If there's a specific language I need to use or whatever mm. for them to recognize that or yeah. so. Yeah. Okay. All right. I guess that's that. Next slide. Uh, yes. So I don't know, Mike. I don't know if you want to wrap this up here. I guess this is. Yeah. There, we were. There were some comments received that were more narrative, um, and they were not incorporated as they 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 don't impact the technical information necessary to port skip. 
they were references to the intro, the abstract, and uh, background information, where references were occurring, and and I, it was it was I guess I, I not to be quite blunt, but you know someone's opinion that that doesn't really impact what we really want people to concentrate mm. on, which is the technical information. So I I didn't want to start moving stuff around for the sake of one person's opinion, um, and it. That, that doesn't really, is just a story and anyone can tell the story in different ways. So we left it, it just seemed like an easier way to go. Um, and the, the comments which impact the technical understanding that, that were discussed here uh, with the resolution, we'll put that into the draft RFC. We would look for, you know, Dan was asking for information of how to approach IANA about uh, updating what is presently there to reflect well, for instance, an RFC number when we get it here, but you know that, that we didn't know what the specific procedures, who to contact, and how to do that. So we may be looking for guidance there. Um, and you know, after that, we uh, you know we can update this document, and we can update IANA in parallel once we have something of an RFC number to tell them to put into place. But what are the next steps? What's next after this? Um, or go ahead. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, I think it's it's basically the main thing here is to uh, update the IANA uh, in uh, registration section to, to do the things we talked about. Um, in terms of next steps uh, beyond this, it would be the Shepherd write-up. Um, the issue we're having, I think, right now is I think it's stabilizing. They, they changed a bunch of the questions and, and the uh, shepherding procedure. Uh, but as soon as, uh, but that would be the next step beyond this once you've submitted a, a new draft. I guess the sector review is still outstanding, but hopefully that'll show up at some point. Um, but I don't think we have to wait for that to show up. Right. Yeah. Because I, I wasn't quite clear about exactly from the art art review exactly what specific things that they said that were a problem that would prevent this from moving forward. I mean, there was, there was a comment about some of the initial language up front, the boilerplate uh, documents for the 2119 20, reference. Um, and we changed that, but they just, mm -hmm. I guess we weren't clear about exactly which which particular issues that were raised that were showstoppers for, for that group, so. Yeah, it would be the, I think the, the ones you do have to fix are the IANA issues. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and you know the re the references which we just talked about. So I think we've pretty much gone over everything that would be, you know, uh, would be an impediment to moving forward. Okay. All right. We'll get that updated review probably next week. I guess we'll see if we can get version two out. Great. All right. Okay. I think Thank I think you. that's it. Yeah, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Bernard? Thank you. OK, uh, so we'll try to make this quick. This is an update on 7983BIS. Next slide. So uh, I think you've all heard what this is basically about. It's an attempt to multiplex quick with SRTP, SRTCP, STUN, TURN, DTLS, and ZRTP. Um, and it does include an update to DTLS content tech field with no other change. Next slide. So the working group last call completed on June 6th. We got uh, three major comments. Um, one was from Martin, who was concerned that uh, some of the text had quick version dependencies. For example, we explicitly mentioned the quick short and long headers, which could conceivably change in some uh, future version. Uh, David pointed out that uh, we, our language about the quick greasing was uh, somewhat vague and suggested a much more specific language. Don't send the, the transport parameter. Um, another question he raised was relating to demultiplexing of churn channels and quick. Um, and Jonathan also chimed in on that, uh, which, and I'll talk a little bit about the resolution, but it's basically along the lines Jonathan suggested, which is that um, the overlap between turn channels and quick isn't actually a big problem because the turn channel packet should only come from a turn server. So we'll talk about that in a little bit, uh, a little bit more. Next slide. 
So this is the updated diagram. It's basically the same as what we had before, but we took out references to the quick, short, and long headers. Basically, we just say forward it to quick, and then whatever quick version you happen to have, we'll figure out what, what those uh, packets mean, assuming it's, it's, getting, it's being forwarded correctly. So we don't really have to uh, put in version-specific things here. Um, and so that's the change in the diagram. Next. So uh, in terms of changes, uh, we had uh, major changes were in section one and section two. Um, and in section one, we basically said, hey, we are compatible with quick version two the, in, the, in its draft form, uh, but not with the quick bit greasing. And as a result, you must not send the, that transport parameter. Um, and then in section two, this is where we uh, talk about the overlap between turn channels and quick and how to deal with it. So this kind of is, is uh, important text. Um, and basically what we're saying here is along the lines of what Jonathan suggested, which is that the overlap isn't a real problem um, because you would only get the turn channel packets from a turn server. Uh, and what, what that means is you basically, as Jonathan said in his message, you only really need to be able to disambiguate the turn from, uh, disambiguate stun um, and then the other one is, is disambiguating SRTP, SRTCP, ZRP, DTLS, or quick, um, uh, which won't be sent from, from a source and IP and port that had responded to a turn allocation. So it, it is a little bit different from the previous demultiplexing advice, uh, in, in 7983 and that you do need to keep track of the turn server IP addresses and ports. Uh, to be able to do the demultiplexing. Uh, but I think if you do that, it is uh, the overlap is not an issue. And, and you can unambiguously uh, demultiplex. Yeah, that's uh, next a very good summary of what I suggested. So great, thank you. Okay. So uh, the question here is, have we addressed everything, uh, in particular this, this overlap uh, between, stun, uh, between turn and quick? Um, and if not, is, is there anything else we need to address to kind of address all of the working group last call uh, issues that were brought up? I personally, I think we're probably ready. Um, and I guess since you're the author, I can take over shepherding it. But, um, anybody? Object. Otherwise, we'll go ahead. Great. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you. Okay. Uh, RTP over quick. Who's doing this? Matthews? Uh, yeah. Uh, no, turn that on. Better? Yeah. Okay. So we have a short update on RTP over quick. Um, I will first go through the updates we did between the last interim meeting and the call for adoption, and then later look at some of the open issues and proposed solutions. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we added a scope section in the beginning of the draft, which explains that this draft is um, to, or aiming to um, describe a minimal mapping for uh, application usage of RTP over quick. Um, we try to do the minimal stuff first, and then we can go to more complex scenarios later. Um, the baseline here expects that we have um, a standard quick implementation, but it can benefit from um, quick extensions. Um, we describe some of the um, optimizations we can do to RTP over quick when we have some of these quick extensions and we describe what API, um, what the API of a quick implementation could offer to implement these optimizations. Um, we are um, yeah, limiting this to RTP over quick without doing any changes to quick or RTP and the signaling is to be done in a separate way. Uh, Example uh, could be STP for RTP over quick, which we'll look at later. Next slide. Uh, then there was a discussion on the mailing list that we need an ALPN. We have added a section for this in the 
I think in the beginning of the draft, um, that an ALPN is required by Quick to set up a connection, and we defined RTP MOOC Quick to indicate that this um, that it would be possible to um, multiplex different flows uh, next to RTP on the same Quick connection. Um, we will go back to that later in a issue I will talk about later in a slide. And we um, added, similar to other drafts, uh, defining ALPN's uh, subsection, which is to re be removed later to add a suffix to the ALPN as long as this is in draft state so that one can identify the draft, which is identified by this ALPN, the draft version. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we added a section on API considerations, um, which basically lists a set of features which um, quick implementations can provide to help implementing certain optimizations. Uh, the section is split into two subsections. One is um, listing informations that the quick implementation or the quick stack could expose to the um, application layer to help um, implementing the optimizations in um, RTP. Uh, that includes, for example, the MDU size to send datagrams of the correct size, uh, acknowledgments as um, they are listed in the RTCP section, which we talked about already earlier. Um, things like stream states, so we added streams in the last meeting, or I talked about that, I think, and if we are using streams, then we need to know something like how far is the stream progress, so is the RTP packet um, completely sent or is, is it not so that the RTP implementation or the application implementation can make a decision whether it wants to keep the stream open to allow for retransmissions or whether it wants to cancel the stream because it's too late to transmit the packets. Um, and then the sec second um, subsection of the API considerations um, uh, lists some methods that could be exposed by a quick implementation such as canceling streams if we want to, uh, or for example, setting congestion controllers. Uh, next slide, please. And then we have a few more other options, which are uh, little uh, changes in the sections which are already there. Uh, we restrict RTP sessions for now to use either quick streams or quick datagrams, not both at the same time. Um, different RTP sessions can use quick streams and datagrams, so just not within one um, session. Uh, and then we add um, some implications um, about the mapping from quick statistics to RTCP when quick streams are used. I think I already mentioned this in the last meeting that in this case the connections are not exactly what um, is uh, in the network because due to retransmissions um, we um, have other statistics than we would have if we would use RTCP and we added an application to or a note to the draft um, that an application should be aware of this. It might be what the application wants to know but it um, needs to keep in mind that this is not exactly what RTCP would give. Uh, then we added a little subsection about um, congestion control considerations when a quick connection is shared between um, RTP sessions and other um, data streams. Uh, yeah, Mo? Mo? Yeah, uh, Mazzarelli, just a question about the first point. Um, wh what's, the, uh, what's the point of the restriction on not being able to use uh, streams and datagrams simultaneously? Uh, for now, for us, it was just um, because we wanted to do the simple thing first. We are not exactly sure what the implications are if we, one session is using both. Um, we might loosen this restriction later, I would say, but we were just not clear about what um, the implications are of this. Okay, so just, just FYI, in, 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 some other, um, in some other usages of media over quick, like, like in mock and quicker, we are actively sending both uh, streams and datagrams, and we see a lot of use cases where that, that actually has some benefits. Yeah, um, thanks. I see there's someone else in the queue, but I can't read the name from here. Uh, no, I think that's just, I didn't, oh, Bernard. Yeah, um, so I did want to follow up on what Mo was talking about. You know, particularly when, you, when you're when you bundling things together, right? There might be, uh, you, might, you might have a, bu a bunch of things on the same quick connection. You might be sending data 
Um, and that actually led me to a question about the ALPN, you know, you're suggesting RTP MUX, but you might also be sending data on that connection. Um, presumably, if you're sending data, you still would want the, the same congestion control. For example, if you're, if you're doing audio and video and you're sending data, that data, you know, might well use the same low latency algorithm, right? You don't necessarily care, uh, uh, that, and the algorithm would take care of, of multiplexing those two things. So anyway, I, I think the main thing is uh, it would be good to actually have some goals in there to address some of the questions that Mo had um, so that we're clear about what, what we're trying, what the scope of what we're trying to do is um, and why we're imposing some of these restrictions so that we can understand uh, whether we want them or not. Mo? Uh, Mo's around again. J just to clarify, the, uh, the use cases that uh, I had in mind were sending audio as datagrams and video as streams or a complex video stream, layered video stream, uh, the dependent layers as uh, streams, uh, the independent layers as streams and the dependent layers as datagrams. Those are the specific examples that I was at. Yeah, uh, yeah Mo, and I, I've, seen, I've seen usage, similar usage where the base layer is sent as reliable uh, and the upper layers are sent as datagrams. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you're quite. Uh, just quickly on this, um, we, we have that on our radar, as, as much as said. Um, it's since there is different ways of, you could, of how you could prioritize one thing over the other. The quick datagram graph currently says that if there's a datagram coming, you send that first. There's a bunch of implications to be understood. And uh, this is what we currently have on our agenda of trying to figure out. Um, so there is not a. Um, a disagreement with this idea, but uh, it's, it's it's not completely obvious uh, what kind of feature interactions been using both at the same time for different things would there, there would be. That's all. Yeah, um, and in yeah. fact, uh, we, we've seen some of these algorithms implemented and they didn't have the effect that was intended. Uh, for example, saying you send the datagrams right away doesn't necessarily, as I think you pointed out, mean you get low delay. <laughs> So it sounds like there's interest in that, but perhaps, you know, needs more investigation. Uh, okay, then we added uh, considerations on connection migration and zero RTT in our discussion section and some minimal considera uh, security considerations. Next slide, please. Um, there are currently four open issues in the GitHub repository. Um, so, one thing which we have not as a GitHub repository first, um, in the GitHub repository first, uh, translators forwarding UDP packets uh, from or RTP packets over UDP received via RTP over Quick um, are bound to the MTU of the UDP packets. And in our current draft, it says that we can use streams for RTP packets where one RTP packet is sent on one stream and that could potentially be larger than the MTU in the UDP, um, which it's being forwarded to. So that is um, one problem that we might have to solve. Um, then two issues for which we already have um, pull requests in the GitHub repository. The first one is retransmission flow IDs. There was a question that um, on which flow ID a RTP packet has to be retransmitted. Um, and I would say that is up to where or which RTP stream that um, RTP packet is retransmitted in, and then the flow ID will be that of this RTP session. Um, then there was a question about which screen times we're using, and we added a pull request which says that we are actually only using unidirectional because we intend to close the stream as, as soon as the RTP packet is transmitted, and in um, that case, we don't have any data flowing in the other direction because we cancel the stream after or close the stream afterwards anyway, so we're using unidirectional streams. Um, Stefan? Uh, this is regarding the first bullet there, translate or forwarding packets over UDP. Uh, my suggestion, without really fully understanding what you're doing there, my suggestion is to not over-engineer, right? Um, sender stupidity is something uh, you, you can't design against, yeah? If, if a sender, if, if you're in a scenario, in which you will be probably in the next 10 or 20 years, uh, where there may be a gateway involved that, that speaks UDP on the other side, and 
the center is stupid enough to create uh, packets that are that are megabyte long, well, tough, right? Uh, business will take care of that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks. This is Spencer Dawkins. Um, we talked with uh, Matthew a little, uh, a little bit about this earlier today, I think, and uh, one of the things I was suggesting was that there's lots of different kinds of RTP translators in middle boxes, uh, like there's an RFC full of them. And for us to be real, uh, in addition to what Stefan was saying, um, it's good to be real clear on what kind of middle box we're talking about here because there's lots of them and there's probably one or two that we might have in mind for use with uh, RTP with uh, RTP over quick. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think we'll look into this. Ron? There's a bunch of things here uh, that, that this group is doing or may do that um, may have impact on RTP topologies. Um, so it may be worth thinking about how to get that information somewhere. Um, I'm thinking in particular about end-to-end -end encryption. There may be situations where, you know, a main can't, wouldn't be able to adjust the MTU size or, or anything like that. And I think this is just one of them. Um, so just something to think about. Okay, thanks. Okay, then the last two issues are... Um, two issues to which we don't have solutions yet. The first one is considerations about stream concurrency because in Quick, uh, we need, or the sender needs credits to open streams and the receiver has to provide enough credits for that. And Lucas Pardu opened this issue and suggested that we should add some considerations about that because it limits the amount of parallel RTP packets um, which are currently being transmitted. And, um, we should probably give some guidance on this, how a receiver has to manage this. And then the last one is also from Lucas Pardew is um, what happens if datagrams are not enabled. And he suggested that we could um, encode something for this case in uh, the ALPN tokens or create multiple ALPN tokens, for example, to let senders and receivers negotiate in uh, the connection establishment, what kind of transmission they are going to use, streams or datagrams, or use transport parameters for that. And um, but then we also have the um, external signaling for um, setting or negotiating the sessions, probably in SDP, for example. And um, what what would happen if I, for example, negotiate something in SDP and then the connection setup does something else? So that's an issue we are um, having in the um, GitHub repositories currently, and we don't exactly know how to resolve this yet. Um, yeah, and I think these are the current issues. Uh, if there's input from the working group, that would be probably quite helpful. Um, and then next slide. So um, as the next steps or recent steps, we submitted a working group draft this week, um, and then we're going to continue with working with Spencer on the SDP signaling. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have for now. And you know. Um, j just a comment, in, in the web transport working group, we also talked about whether datagrams should be required, and it was pointed out that this is very easy to implement in Quick, so it, it, there's no real excuse for not doing it in a Quick implementation, so the, the thinking was just require it, you know, in a transport parameter and, and just get it up, you know, get it over with there. Whether you use it or not in SDP is a different story, but at the Quick layer, just require that they do datagrams. Okay. okay. All right. I think anything else on this or Spencer? Thank you. So I'm Spencer Dawkins, and I'm um, 
the follow-on to Mathis and uh, York. Uh, next slide, please. So basically remembering that um, my goal with an individual draft was to do a minimal SDP specification, which roughly tracks uh, the draft that has now been uh, adopted by the ABT core working group um, and to track more high level issues in a separate repo uh, that I think a lot of the discussion will not end up in the minimal STP specification. So um, at this ITF, I'm providing an update based on the, it was, I was actually looking at dash four of the individual draft, but I think the only change was the name uh, to reflect adoption. And um, please feel free to provide feedback to on the mailing list also. And um, my goal is to issue a dash one, uh, dash one of the minimal specification before our next WT core meeting. Um, eventually, I think it would be good for me to request adoption of uh, the minimal specification. Uh, so, uh, but I'm not doing that at this time. Um, next slide, please. So, what ABT core, uh, sorry, ABP profiles to register was uh, issue number five. Uh, first of the last interim was to register one profile, uh, quick RTP ABTPF, and um, noting that the secure ABP profiles are most useful when bridging to non quick RTCP, RTP. And uh, we were saying that we would have that conversation. We would revise the RTP topologies RFC. And of course, I forgot to prepend UDP for consistency in the registry. My apologies. And then other related questions started popping up. Uh, what about datagrams, streams versus datagrams on the next slide? And uh, will we need ICE, uh, TCP, uh, which is a new issue? Uh, next slide, please. So, um, like I said, the RTP over streams datagrams are both chosen up in a couple of places. Um, issue number eight and issue number nine, uh, or sorry, number three. Um, right now, um, there's discussion of including a, a shared uh, capability as well um, in the draft we've adopted, although I'm getting slightly ahead of where the, the uh, adopted draft is. So my proposal would be to do stream, datagram, and shared if we get to shared, uh, based, just based on the discussion we're having about that draft. Next slide, please. Uh, this is new. Do we need TCP ICE? Uh, this is from Roman. Um, and we, this is my summary of his longer explanations that are on list. I, I would recommend uh, taking a look at those. Um, his key point, as I understand it, uh, is that we need, we need a way to fall back to TCP. If we can use ICE TCP candidates, we do have a fallback. And if we can't, what's the alternative? Uh, his proposal was to also register TCP quick, RTP, AD, ADPF, style profiles, and um, there's actually a continuing discussion since I sent the slides in on the mailing list about, well, why would we not just, just you know, go, go to uh, RTP over, uh, over TCP? Um, like I say, uh, more working group discussion. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, York? Yeah. Your uh, just to, to point out that that probably requires some some fundamental and explanation on the list because I haven't yet fully understood how this reason chain of reasoning came into being that that would need to be registered. If we are worried about running two congestion controls, one in Scream or something on top of Quick, um, 
we should be even more worried about running three congestion controllers on top of each other if we, th if we tunnel the whole thing then to, to TCP. That just doesn't sound about what we, sh what we would want to be doing. Yeah, um, Roman, I'll let you respond first, then I'll, I guess, I'll put myself in the queue for as an intellectual. Yeah. So uh, the basic problem is, is that if we're using the, like ICE machinery for setting up uh, calls, they come with certain kind of features, which again, haven't been designed for RTP over quick. They've been designed for RTP over UDP. And uh, they come with uh, support for tunneling over TCP or TLS. Like for instance, you, uh, if you, so if you uh, use turn servers, you are relaying through a intermediary server and one of the relays can be over TCP to a turn server and from turn server over UDP to whatever is using, uh, whatever is the party on the other end. So it's kind of part of ICE machinery. Uh, the other uh, situation is, uh, the other kind of extension is uh, ICE TCP, which is where you try to establish a TCP connection uh, between the uh, uh, like two ICE or, uh, agents, and you tunnel the protocol over a TCP connection. Uh, and I guess the main complicating factor that people kind of miss in all of this is that the way ICE operates is that you can end up, for instance, with uh, your packets going over a TCP connection, and in the process of nomination, your same uh, or, or protocol, which is running on top, can switch to UDP. Like the typical example would be it takes some time to set up a turn relay, which would be over UDP. So, and your ICE TCP candidates will work first. So like you, like you start negotiating connection over ICE TCP and then you switch to uh, relay through a turn server while the protocol is still being set up while you're basically sending initial packets for media. So it's like, so it's kind of all designed to work together and uh, not necessarily ideal for what we're doing with RTP over quick, but if we, are, if we want to use the ICE machinery, we kind of like, stuck with it or we need to redesign it uh, to, uh, to work differently but again that's a fairly heavy uplift so that's ki uh, that's kind of where this whole tcp tunneling comes from and the candidate uh, like uh, actually comes from like again some of the quirks of uh, sdp ice negotiation and that's why I had to add those uh, like TCP versions of protocols for DTLS, SRTP, and uh, did, uh, like for the uh, MRCP. It's just because of the like in a certain sequence of events, you end like you need to signal that you are sending stuff over a TCP tunnel, and that's the only way to specify it. It doesn't typically affect the overall row protocol, but it's again not ideal because. There are multiple layers of uh, packet congestion. Um, uh, there are multiple issues with uh, head of the line congestion when you're tunneling over TCP, which are again undesirable. But it's kind of been treated as a, uh, a, a, a treated as, as uh, like as, as, uh, yeah. So it, anyway, so the, the, it's just uh, if we're using ice, like we need it. If we're not using ice, we need to come up with alternative for going through. Uh, essentially negotiating uh, connection from behind that or behind virtual research. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I uh, should uh, just make the observation that uh, Roman, I, and uh, York are the three people that are talking on the mailing list right now, but the discussion is happening in a mail in a th email thread with a not particularly obvious subject. Uh, I would suggest that uh, we plan to do more discussion on the mailing list between now and our next meeting, and uh, that the next person to reply change the subject. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, Jonathan Lennox is an individual. I was going to say, I mean, part of the problem is that ICE stacks generally, the obvious implementation is to get to abstractly provide a datagram API, and then the ICE, ICE stack figures out how you get end to end. So, um, your suggestion of doing RTP over TLS, well, abstractly that would be a cleaner thing than quick over TCP would be, would mean you have to set, feed entirely different things down into your stack depending on what the ICE negotiated, which would be very much a layer violation in terms of having to know what the, your ICE stack is doing. 
Thank you. Bernard? Um, yeah, uh, my, my comment was that I, I think we may not be thinking about this uh, at a high enough level. Basically, within QUIC, we always have to think about failover, right? And, and often that's done at the app layer. So as an example, in web transport, we fail over from HTTP 3 to HTTP 2. Um, and that does have a whole other series of, of issues with it because obviously you can't emulate QUIC. But um, I, I wouldn't mess, as, as uh, Horst said, I, running uh, you know, multiple layers of congestion control, RTP congestion control over QUIC congestion control over TCP, that's just going to be a disaster. I wouldn't even want to imagine to analyze that. Like BBRV2 over New Reno, scream over BBRV2 over New Reno. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, the problem is that the way we have to do the selection is ICE, and I don't think we want a new selection mechanism in this space. Um, Bernard, I would make the observation that uh, I was thinking about this roughly as a quick failover uh, thing like you were talking about, but that was mostly because I don't understand ICE well enough to go lower. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just wanted to suggest that we, we really try to write this down as, in, as, as emails because I get a stack overflow when I'm trying to follow that, uh, <clears throat> that explanation. I also want to remark that back in the days when I, my, my, my dim memory comes, tries to remember what I had been, what we had been doing when I was chairing M music at the time, um, you could tell ICE what you wanted to negotiate, right? So if we have an API abstraction problem, that's a different thing from being a protocol from being a protocol and signaling problem. Mm -hmm. And we shouldn't be getting uh, the letter in the way of getting the former uh, this other thing right. Thank you, uh, Roman. After that, I'm going to close this. Yeah. This so just, again, just to reiterate. Uh, again, ICE, as far as I know, with its current implementations, cannot uh, include like a non-uniform protocols. You cannot negotiate between RTP over TLS and like let's say quick over TP using ICE, partially because you are sending media uh, and you're sending data from a higher level protocol during the nomination. So the candidates are changing. And your protocol, like underlying transport protocol, is changing while you are sending media. So it it's essentially means like figuring out the transition from RTP over Quick to RTP over TLS. And, uh, or it's actually like switching between Quick uh, handshake and RTP over TLS handshake in the middle of the handshake. And this is just like, uh, like not something that it. Uh, is possible to do. It's like it's designed to send the same kind of sending the same higher level product. I look forward to continued discussions on the mailing list. Thank you, Roman, and thank you for raising the issue. Next slide. So we were um, having a conversation about. Um, what to do with quick congestion control and whether we need to be able to explicitly ask an implementation or do things. Uh, and where we were at the last interim meeting, I guess, was that uh, I was proposing we explore whether um, whether RTP running over quick uh, was a problem in practice at the congestion control issues. Um, now that we're recommending, or now that uh, the draft we adopted has uh, is registering an ALPN. Uh, the other, the quick implementation of the other end, we'll know this is something like RTP. So the proposal is that the SDP should carry ALP, ALPNs because uh, that allows the uh, use of multiple draft versions and experiments and things like that. And the next slide, next slide. Oh, sorry, Bernard. Please jump right in. Yeah, um, my my concern would be you're now creating uh, additional complexity. Um, you know, for example, in in WebRTC, we don't negotiate ALPNs within DTLS, right? So um, I would I would question why you need to do that at multiple places because 
you, you'll then, oh, I negotiated this ALPM, but I got another one. You just have to check both of them. So it just creates additional failure modes. Um, so just something to think about whether, whether in fact, this, this avoids failures or, or it adds to, to the brittleness. Um, Bernard, I, I'm, I was thinking of this, maybe not quite right, but uh, the way that quick uh, variants were uh, being uh, advertised in AOPN before version one was finalized. Is, is, am I not getting that right? Let us make, make the slides go away. I'm sorry. Up here. Yeah, it, it had yeah. version, there's also version negotiation, which is different. Um, yeah, it's, it's a complicated subject because it, it did create a lot of brittleness because the people would only advertise the last two versions. And then sometimes if you got versions ahead, you just wouldn't be able to connect. Uh, right. So I, I think what you're talking about may be that I am um, getting a little bit ahead of where we need to be with this in the, uh, in the, in uh, the SDP uh Discussions. Yeah, no, thank you. Like I say, we'll we'll talk some more on the mailing list. Any more slides? Okay, this one. Oh yeah. Uh, how to ask for quick feedback is new. Uh, we want to allow implementations to ask quick for feedback. This is in the draft. Um, well, see? yeah, uh, Mosin. Sorry, I was I was um, previous uh, referencing the previous slide okay, about sure. uh, ALPNs. Um, I, I, I don't, uh, I understand where the AL, ALPN purists are coming from that, okay, I just operate generic web servers and I have no idea people connecting to them blindly are going to get, you know, H3 or H2 or, or something else or, or not even a HTTP service, but something else. I understand that aspect, but I think this is very different because you're talking about uh, a signaling exchange before where, you know, the, the parties know what what the service is. It's not a blind uh, a client going to a port number. Um, so I, I don't think uh, registering a bunch of ALPNs to describe very complex SDPs is useful. Um, if you mux 20 different things, I don't think it's worth all the permutations of ALPNs being registered um, to, to say that, okay, I, I made mux these 20 different things. The SDP is being explicit about what is being connected to. Yeah. Um, so I don't think the LPN really provides any benefit whatsoever there. Yeah. So I uh, make two observations there. Um, one is um, that what, what I'm talking about is um, if there are two different versions of the uh, RTP over quick uh, specification that you support, that you would have two different ALPNs for those, but that you're not, you know, that you're not registering a bunch of ALPNs depending on what the SDP says. Does but but wouldn't you think that if you have different uh, RTP over quick versions, that you also have different SDP for those RTP over quick versions? It seems it seems unimaginable to me that ALPN is really the way to disambiguate all this stuff. There's going to be a boatload of SDP way before you hit the ALPN. I believe you. <laughs> Thank you. Back to the next slide. Um, so basically, uh, now that we want to allow optionally uh, in the current draft, um, substituting transport layer feedback for RTCP feedback for some, uh, for some aspects of feedback, um, and like I say, recognizing that we are trying to reduce overhead where possible and that mapping may require some creativity. Um, one of the proposals that's in the um, draft that the working group has adopted is um, that uh, Quick does not have NAC, but it can interpret, you know, it can detect lost packets. So if it bounces that back up as a NAC, uh, or an RTP implementation could know what to do with it. Um, my question here is, uh, in order to do this, um, do, well, are we talking about enabling transport layer feedback as a clump, or are we naming individual pieces of transport feedback, layer feedback that you want to get? Um, my proposal was to um, you, to request this as a clump 
Um, but again, this, this is the first time I'm talking about this with the working group. So this almost certainly needs more working group discussion unless everybody wants to just agree with me. Uh, Bernard? Yeah, I think we're going to need to discuss this in more detail because um, it, it, along with, I think, the quick requirements for the transport, because um, you're going to be negotiating, you know, just as transport parameters, a whole bunch of quick extensions and things like that, which may impact your ability to do things. Um, and then on top of that, you have the what I think of as the RTP negotiation, where you're saying what RTCP mechanisms you're using. Um, so I, I'd be a little bit concerned about the interaction between all that stuff. Um, and so I think we, um, uh, you know, as an example, we, we should be real clear about what we might not be doing. Like we might not, we might be doing using quick acts, but that might require timing extensions. And then if we have a whole bunch of stuff, we might be able to not negotiate max just as a weird example. Um, so, uh, I think we need to dig into the transport requirements, um, and, and understand fully um, what we're like, what we need to get rid of various things. Um, I would uh, thank you, Bernard. I would agree, and uh, I would I would uh, observe that a lot of the discussion that we've had has been assuming that datagram was an option before datagram was. You know, I think the I think we started talking about this before Datagram was a working group draft in Quick. Uh, now that it's an RFC and Quick is starting to do other extensions that might be relevant to us, um, that's probably a good thing for us to keep in mind as well. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I guess my question is: Are we? Is it? Do we want to try to? Oh, Mo, I guess you're first. Uh, Mo Zanetti, on, on the previous topic uh, for feedback. Uh, one, one thing to note from this morning's quick session, uh, this proposal for quick timestamps uh, to be adopted, I think it's very relevant for RTP uh, or, or media in general. Um, so I think if people here want to support things like the RTCP feedback formats that do have timestamps and they'd like to carry those over to quick, I think uh, you should chime in on the quick list to say that you support that timestamp extension being added to quick. Right. Uh, Chris, uh, Christian Whitma, who is the author of the NQIC, was um, asking if the working group was ready to uh, adopt the timestamps draft. And um, the working group was kind of sort of maybe, if I'm characterizing them correctly. And, um, but that, um, um, I, you know, I did say, you know, ABT Core is interested in this for some of the media, uh, real-time media uh, congestion control mechanisms that use timestamps, and uh, it may be, it may be correct that uh, the mock, the mock stuff um, goes goes the same way. Also, desiring to use timestamps, so um, Mo's point is well taken. Uh, I think the chairs would be uh, in uh, quick would be uh, sympathetic to people expressing the you know views about this and saying uh, some variation of we need this for media because we're using timestamps anyway. Uh, but thank you for bringing that up. Now. So Spencer, do you think are you asking for your draft to be adopted at this time, or do you want to continue doing it as an individual? Um, my goal, so my goal, now that we have our own working group draft for quick over SD, SDP or RTP over quick, yeah. how many, how many times, how many, how many stacks are we talking about here? Yeah. Um, but now that we have our own working group draft, my goal would be to try to keep my draft, uh, synchronized with the working group protocol specification, um, like within a meeting cycle. Okay. And um, so I would like to get my draft coordinated with uh, the uh, working group draft in protocol specification um, by the next time we have a uh, ABT core meeting, or are we having an interim? And uh, whenever that is, and uh, ask, for, ask the working group to consider an option at that point. Thank okay. you. All right, thank you. 
Okay, uh, V3C, who's presenting? Lauri, go ahead. Um, I'm going to be presenting. So this is Lauri Lala. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Maybe a little louder, if you can. No? Yeah, that's good. Can someone confirm that? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Yes. Can you hear us? OK, so um, at least someone confirmed that they're hearing me. So I'm going to be presenting the progress on the RTP payload format for B3C. Uh, next slide, please. So just as a brief background, we brought, first brought this topic to ABT Core in a virtual meeting in February this year. And since then, we've been receiving some amount of feedback, not much. Um, and uh, just to, as a quick refresher, so this V3C uh, encoding enco is like intending to reuse existing 2D video coding technologies and compress a volumetric video using that. And it is, in fact, designed to be video codec agnostic, so you can use pretty much any video codec available. So what it does is it uh, decomposes a 3D volumetric video frame into video component components and Atlas uh, component, uh, the Atlas component being mostly metadata, which describes how the video components can be reproje reprojected back into the video, back into the 3D space. Uh, the compression of this Atlas metadata is defined in this ISO standard. And its high level syntax or syntax rather is represented as null units that are very similar to HEVC or BBC null units. Next slide, please. So the way we proposed and planned to um, develop this V3C RTP payload format is therefore also aligned with the video coding specifications. So the video components can be streamed according to the respective uh, RTP payload specifications. Again, you can pretty much use whatever video codec you want to use and then choose the corresponding RFC for the payload format. The issue is that there currently is no RTP payload format for this Atlas data, which is the metadata that describes the reprojection of these video components into the back into the 3D frame. And therefore, we were proposing to define an encapsulation uh, for these NAL Atlas NAL units uh, into RTP packets. Uh, along with that, we propose uh, some B3C specific, specific payload format parameters, which operate just the same way as video coding payload format parameters do. Uh, then, in addition, there's a new grouping type that we are proposing, which allows you to group multiple video component streams and Atlas streams uh, together to indicate that these streams, media streams, should be consumed uh, together. And lastly, there's this uh, reference to uh, bundling, uh, which is using this RFC 8843, which essentially allows you to bundle these multiple streams into a single session or a single stream. Next slide, please. Uh, so since, the since we first introduced the topic, we've received some amount of feedback. So the first feedback was from the meeting. And based on that, we refined the payload format. So uh, we removed a lot of the uh, stuff that was inherited from HEVC RTP payload format. And then, for example, dropped the multi-time aggregation package and refined the payload format parameters uh, section and so on. So essentially, just cleaned it up a bit. And after that, we've only received a couple of um, minor improvements, just suggestions, mostly focusing on edit editorial stuff. And uh, just as a reminder, so we're managing this feedback on this uh, behind this GitHub link. Next slide, please. So in order to solicit more feedback, and continue to progress the draft, uh, we would like to propose uh, a working group adoption at this point. Um, I hope that is something that we can all agree to. And uh, yeah, now any questions or comments? Uh, 
Um, anybody? Um, Stefan? So this is in, within, as far as I can understand, within the scope of the working group, so it, and it's sufficiently mature, so I have no problems in adopting it. Uh, I have one other thing, and that is, um, uh, Laurie, you will soon run into the same issue which the Green Metadata people ran into uh, a few weeks ago, and that is uh, the public availability of ISA documents for free. Um, and uh, I can offer my service there again uh, to um, uh, distribute uh, that you, uh, you um, um, Point Cloud people sent me a, a late pre ballot uh, draft or pointer to it on the MPEG site, an end document, a November document. And uh, people who want to review this ISO document, this ISO standard, can contact me privately and I will uh, forward it to those people. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. All right. So, um, yeah, I think it sounds like certainly is in scope. So I suspect, I think what we should do is we should do a call for adoption on the mailing list. Um, this will give you a chance to uh, also, um, ex you know, the community that's interested in this can express their interest, but it's certainly in scope. So I think um, we'll do a call for adoption. Unless you disagree, Bernard, but I think. I think we need to move on to the next. Uh, we do, yeah, we're, we're, we're covered tight on time. All right, so yeah, finally, um, green metadata. Sorry for you know giving making you a little tight on time here, but let's. All right, so I try to be on time. I'm okay. Prakar, and this is about uh, RTCP messages for green metadata. Next slide, please. So this is about uh, the epic specification. Uh, Can you move closer to the mic? So yeah, try to try to be right on access. All right. Mic. Yeah. Uh, I hope yeah. this works better now. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. So this is about uh, the ISO specification uh, 23001-11, which is energy efficient uh, media consumption. So this is talking about how encoding and decoding can be done in a more energy efficient fashion. So uh, this specification provides two sets of uh, metadata. One is this uh, video encoder generated, uh, which is complexity information being sent to the decoder so that it can uh, you know, adapt its decoding. But this, these uh, sets of metadata sent via supplemented uh, SEI uh, within the video stream. So this is not the focus of the uh, draft here. The focus of this draft is a second set of metadata, which is the decoder feedback uh, messages. So uh, the decoder sends some feedback and encoder tries to adopt accordingly uh, the energy consumption uh, at the decoding end. So we needed a format for that, those messages, because uh, there is no RTCP format defined for this. And this is the format that is being specified, uh, outlined by this draft, and the current version is linked here. Uh, this draft is uh, providing two uh, new RTCP messages. One is to post push a resolution request, and the other one is the feedback message uh, from the encoder, uh, which is the to post push uh, resolution notification. Next slide, please. So uh, the new messages are specified in a similar fashion to uh, the payload specific feedback messages, uh, which are defined in AVPF. So uh, as mentioned, the two new messages, uh, they, are, they can be sent as a full compound RTCP packet or an uh, early RTCP packet. The reason being is that these messages are not very time critical. Um, so uh, you, you can send them as LRTCP messages if the application so needs, but this is not required. Um, and then the main idea is that the first message on the top, this is what the decoder sends towards the encoder when it wants the encoder to adapt the energy, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the decoder energy consumption. And this is done via this typical uh, message format, SSRC, C plus number. And then obviously these are the key elements here, frame rate, picture width, picture height, which is the request that the decoder is sending. Okay, please adopt to this uh, new resolution or uh, frame rate. And then uh, as um, these messages go, uh, there is a feedback message from the encoder back to the decoder. It has similar information fields here, uh, but the reason of these uh, information fields is that 
the encoder might be trying to adopt from multiple decoders. So it might have a different decision to do. So it informs the decoder, hey, this is what I've do done with your request. So next slide, please. Some comments about uh, timing and uh, security. So as uh, mentioned before, uh, the encoder might be catering for multiple decoders. So if there are multiple messages coming in, then the encoder needs to decide, you know, uh, joint need of optimization. So one decoder is saying that, another one is saying that. So the encoder has to make a decision. As mentioned before, messages are not time critical. Um, so they're sent using regular RTCP timing. Uh, some security considerations have been documented in this draft, which is, um, the message is approved, or uh, there's a malicious message. It might the decoder might request a, a malicious message might request an extremely low video quality, or I mean, we just re recently were thinking uh, it could be a request for extremely high video quality that the whole decoding can stall. So um, yes, yeah, some integrity, uh, integrity protection authentication is required. That can be done in a very simple fashion to AVPF as using SRTP or SAVPF. Next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, that's the last slide that I have. So that's the purpose to gather feedback. We already have some feedback comments from Jonathan that we mostly acknowledge, and we are already working on a draft to uh, to implement that. Uh, the, the target is to have more reflected discussion and then incorporate this feedback. And eventually, when the time comes, uh, seek for an adoption. Yes, uh, George. George. Yeah, you're good. I, I have one, one quick question. Um, RTCP, RTCP messages aren't reliable. So are you, are you sending this as kind of soft state that you keep repeating what you expect continuously? Since he has transaction, right? The receiver yeah. sends something, the, the decoder sends a wish to the encoder. The encoder yeah. at some point would respond. How does the decoder know that the encoder ever got what it was sending? Yeah. So this, since there is no acknowledgement in RTCP, yeah. Um, do you repeat this on a constant basis until things get better? Or I didn't find anything in the draft when I was quickly grabbing through it. So, but, but, but I may have missed stuff. So. Yeah, so the, these messages are working in a very similar way as uh, the typical spatial trade off request message in AVPF almost identical fashion. So the decoder sends a message with a specific sequence number. The encoder is supposed to reply to that sequence number. So. Okay. Uh, that's how the decoder finds out uh, that for a given SSRC, for a specific sequence number, it got the message, the, the encoder got the message. Yeah, and I had some questions as an individual. First, uh, thanks to Stefan when he sent me the, the um, ISO document. Um, I see that the, there's actually four different feedback mechanisms in that document, but you're only doing one at this point. Is that all you're intending to do, or is this just your starting point and you're planning to do some of the others as well? Yeah, I think we picked the most important thing that we found at this point in time. It could be uh, based on feedback. If I think there are more messages. Okay, that are I mean, if that's, I mean, if you think this is the one that's the most important, that seems reasonable. I just wanted to see if what your plans were going forward. And then um, the other is, I there are some mechanisms. I'm not sure. I, I, I seem to recall at the SDP level to specify things like frame rate and resolution. Um, to negotiate that at the signaling level. And I want to know, um, is this, to what extent is this um, complementary to that versus overlapping it? I, I would think this is complementary. So STP is then how you're setting up the session. Yeah. And this is more, I think this can work together with it. So okay. then the decoder is sending some messages. So. And the third question I just had is, is there um, any IPR on this that needs to be disclosed? We, yeah, so Qualcomm made an IPR statement. Related they have? To this. Okay, I, yes. I didn't see it, so we should, I'll, I'll, I'll check that out. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Done. Okay, and if that, um, yeah, so you're not, you're not asking for adoption yet. You want to do some more revisions and then? Yes, the idea is getting more feedback, and uh, yeah, eventually we, we would like to seek adoption, but I mean, okay. when, when we cross that bridge. Okay, thank you. All right, great. Well, I think that then wraps us up, unless anybody has any other business in the one minute we have left. Otherwise, thank you all. Um, we'll discuss whether we need an interim. We've been doing interims fairly successfully lately, but once per cycle. So we may do that again, um, depending on how things are progressing. Otherwise, we'll see you all in London. Thank you all very much. Bernard? Thank you. Thank you. See you. Thank mm -hmm. you.